So our, our next speaker, <coughs> Vincent Taroli, is from Arup. He spent most of his career in the New York area working on major infrastructure projects. His presentation, Tunneling Under the Hudson River in the Early 1900s, Lessons Learned, History of the Pennsylvania Railroad into New York City. Mr. Taroli. Tarolo. Just a second Avenue story. Uh, when I got out of the Army in 1968, I, I, I had worked for the TA before I went in the Army. When I got out, uh, they didn't have room for me in the spot I was before I went into the Army, so they put me out on a survey party on 2nd Avenue, surveying for the 2nd Avenue subway. This is 68. The store, the, uh, the store owners came out and asked us what we were doing, so we're surveying for the 2nd Avenue subway. Are you kidding? They were going to build that in 1947. It's never going to get built. I said, no, 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 it's definitely going to get built this time. That was 1968, so <laughs> they're still waiting to get it finished. Right? <laughs> Now I'm going to talk about a, a project that actually got built. Uh, it's little known, I guess. I didn't know about it until a couple years ago. It's a fantastic job and uh, all built with private money. Uh, fantastic project. Let's get into it. So we'll break up the talk into the project people, the controversy, a lot of, and a lot of lessons learned. Uh, it's amazing how far ahead uh, these people were to build this project in terms of, you know, particularly risk management. Okay, the project. Pennsylvania Railroad. Pennsylvania Railroad was the biggest corporation pretty much in America in the turn of the century, 1900s. Uh, unfortunately, the Pennsylvania Railroad had no direct, direct access into New York City. Basically, their trains would go to ferries in New Jersey. The people would disembark from the trains. They would get on ferries. They would take ferries across the river to Manhattan. The freight also went, and actually the freight continued to do that for many years. Uh, from New Jersey into Brooklyn. But basically the major concern was their passenger service had to switch onto a ferry like this and go across the river into Manhattan. I mean obviously you know from this winter how sometimes how difficult it is for these ferries to operate. We have ferry service now that got disrupted tremendously during this, this past winter. Uh, the fence of pain, there was a lot of traffic on the rivers at that time. It was, was hazardous. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad needed, a, needed an option. This is what New York looked at the time. Elevated lines with steam locomotives belching you know, uh, particles up into the air uh, on pedestrians below. Horse-drawn trolleys, some, ele some electric trolleys. There were 150,000 horses in New York. Can you imagine how the streets were at that time? And uh, 11,000 horses died a year. And it's kind of like with cars, people just abandoned them. They took the plates off. They didn't have plates, but they abandoned the horses. On <laughs> they, they abandoned the horses on the street. And one of the reasons the Department of Sanitation came into existence was to get the, the dead horses off the streets of New York. So that's what New York was at that time. And as Doug was saying and others, that's when the impetus came to kind of go underground. So this is the, the main person in terms of the, getting the project going. He didn't live to see the end of it. He died in 1906, as other people have said. That being president of the, of the Pennsylvania Railroad was a kind of a, a tough profession. Everybody died. Everybody died a heart attack before they finished their, their term in office. But Cassatt, again, he Rensselaer Polytech graduate, started out in the field as a rod man. Everybody in, this, in, the, in, these, in these slides I'll talk to you about always started out as either an intern working for an engineering firm, pay or no pay, or else work in the field initially to start. That's very important. They had a lot of field experience. They worked their way up. Whether they were college graduates like Assad, came from a blue blood family, or, or people like, we'll talk about Samuel Ray, who didn't come from a blue blood family, but again, they started out in the field as, as Rodman. Again, he has a, a fantastic resume, built up the Pennsylvania Railroad, but the main emphasis we'll talk about today was the river crossings. So they wanted to get across the river, right? So how do you get across the river in 1890, 1895? You build a bridge. So they hired a, a leading bridge engineer, the you know, most famous person, uh, most of us know in terms of uh, bridge engineering, Lyndon Dahl, to come up with a design. He came up with a design to cross the Hudson with, what, 14 tracks at a cost of $100 million. Unfortunately, because it had to cross the Hudson as a, a bridge, it had to get the approval of the feds. The Pennsylvania Railroad couldn't do it on their own. So to get the approval of the feds, the feds say, okay, you can do it, but you have to have the the tracks have to be open to anybody, not just you. 
you have to allow your competitors to use the tracks also. So the Pennsylvania Railroad went to their competitors and said, well, you know, it's $100 million, why don't we share the cost? Well, the competitor said, well, you know, you're the Pennsylvania Railroad, you're the biggest corporation, why don't you build it? And we'll just use it. So, so <laughs> but you know, it's a, it's a good negotiating ploy. So the Pennsylvania Railroad said, no, we're not, we're not going that way. So they looked at options. Now, it turned out that the Pennsylvania Railroad at that time was developing a relationship with the Long Island Railroad. And the Long Island Railroad was kind of ahead of its time in terms of thinking of ways. They wanted to connect their Long Island tracks to tracks in Manhattan and even into New Jersey. And they hired Charles Jacobs, who becomes a critical person in the story, to make a study. And he came up with a study of connecting Brooklyn and Manhattan with a tunnel. Now, Jacobs' background is from London, so he modeled his, his connection to the way they did things in London. So this is what it was. Now, he was very optimistic about the rock line between Manhattan and, uh, you know, and, and Brooklyn. So he shows a rock tunnel deep. Why? Because in London, they always went down to the, to the London clay. So they always went deep to the London clay. That was the place, area you mined in. You didn't mind in the shallow stuff. You could avoid it. So here's your, here's your tunnel option. And you have elevators. If you look at that uh, right here, those are elevators from the street surface down to the tunnel and the station. Okay? This, is, this was his approach. Again, pop, modeled after London. Fortunately for the whole industry, and, and one thing that Doug talks about in, in his book, and it's an, an important thing to bring out, is that electric traction makes all this possible. Uh, London tried to keep going you know, with their system using steam locomotives underground. It doesn't work very well. So electric traction was a very important aspect of this, of this whole story. And of course, compressed air. Compressed air made subaqueous tunneling possible. Now these are just, this is a busy slide. It's kind of a little history of what's going on at the time. There's, there's the, there, again, that was the uh, uh, London, 1863, Boston, 1897, and then New York, and busy slide, but just to show you things are happening. Now, the one thing we should put in the historic context, you know, the railroads were a modern thing, you know. They had just won the battle at this time over canals. I mean, a lot of people at that time still were into canals. It took them until about 1860 to convince people that railroads made more sense than canals. So then you're jumping from a railroad system to actually putting a tunnel under a, a river. Nobody believed it could, done, could be done, especially heavy rail. We're not talking about trolleys now. We're talking about heavy rail. Anyway, this is the project. I mean, it's, when you look at it, it's, it's mind-boggling in today's terms. This is the project, a yard in New Jersey, the Manhattan transfer, you went from steam locomotives to electric locomotives, tunnels under the Hudson River, tunnels through Manhattan, Pennsylvania Station, tunnels under the East River, and Sunnyside Yard. Okay? They budgeted the job at $50 million. It came in a little higher, $150 million. So it's close, but it's all Pennsylvania Railroad money. Every, bit of, every dollar on job is Pennsylvania Railroad money. No federal funding, no local funding. The only time they had to get involved with the politicians was basically get approval. And, and if you read Jill Jones' book about con conquering Gotham, you'll see how difficult that was to get approval for these things. But once it was approved, it was all Pennsylvania Railroad money. These are the, the main people on the job, and we'll talk about some of them as we go along. I, I gave this talk at, at the office as a trial, and it went like an hour. And I've got 30 minutes, so I'm going through this a little faster than I normally would, but uh, hopefully we'll get it done on schedule. Again, these are some of the jobs that were going on in terms of, of, of shield uh, compressed air tunneling. Actually, Lord Cochrane, I didn't realize at the time, when he developed the system in 1830, he developed the real system. He had locks, he had a whole, it wasn't just a piece of paper with a couple of words on it. He developed a, a real system. Uh, and and a, lot of it, a lot of his ideas were used even when they actually started doing it in the, in the latter part of the century. Now this is the first part of the job that most people know about, the Hudson River crossings. So here is two tunnels crossing the Hudson River, okay? It's a cast iron lining, which of course at that time was the, I mean, it developed in London as, as the way to go, but it became the standard lining as the primary lining, and they always had a secondary lining of, of concrete. Unfortunately, at the time, they felt they had to reinforce the concrete, so a lot of those tunnels had, you know, spiral bars in them, which is too bad, but that's what they did. Uh, the one thing about this tunnel, this was a heavy rail, right? This wasn't a trolley, and they were concerned about settlement. 
And you'll see later on about how to handle risk. One of the things they said, let's, let's build a tunnel so if we had to put piles to support it, we could put piles to support it. So every sixth ring had a special segment where you could actually open up the segment, under air of course, and put a pile into the ground to rock. Again, they didn't know where the rock was either. It's pretty deep in the Hudson, but they, they had this provision. Again, there were four shields, so they drove two shields from each side, two shields from New Jersey, two shields from uh, Manhattan. Uh, O'Rourke Construction did the work. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about him later. It was a hard bid. He had no tunneling experience at all, it was a, but it was a hard bid. His experience was pneumatic caissons, so he had compressed air experience, but no tunneling experience. It was a hard bid because the engineers on this job knew at the time this was the easy part. Everybody thinks as this is the hard part. This is the easy job. The hard part was the, the next phase, is the East River. This was the hard part. This was, first of all, it was more tunnels. It's four tunnels, eight shields, and the ground is totally different. In, 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 in the Manhattan tunnels, once you exited the rock, you were pretty much in your silts and clays, and it was relatively easy mining, and it was that way till you got to the Manhattan side. On the East River tunnels, you were going in and out of rock all the time. You also were dealing with sands and gravels that couldn't hold the compressed air, so the blows were much more common. Uh, they undersized the compressed air plant, so even though they had technically, potentially eight headings, they could only run two or three at a time. They didn't have enough air. They kept losing the air. So they had to shut down headings and they would do it piecemeal because they didn't have enough air. Again, this was kind of when the thing was started, the whole, and again, by the way, talking about uh, firsts, when they did the shield tunneling in, 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 uh, uh, in, in London, it was pretty much in soils. This was in partially in rock. So shields are not designed to go through rock. So literally, they had a blast in front of the shield. So they were blasting in the tunnels to move the shield forward. They would, they would put a cradle, and they would push the shield on a cradle. And then they had to try to fill behind it. Had a lot of issues with deformation of the lining, a lot of big problems. Very difficult work. But the people at that time knew this was going to be difficult. They knew what, was, what they were in for. So this was not a hard bid. This was a negotiated contract. Uh, the contractor, S. Pearson and Son, had done tunneling work in London. They brought them here. They had actually worked on the Hudson and Manhattan tubes in New York previously also. So they knew compressed air tunnels, they knew New York, and, and they wanted a specialty contractor to do this work. So they came here, they negotiated the price. The contra it wasn't just you know, time and material. There were certain items that were the contractor's risk, there were certain items that were the owner's risk. Like I mentioned before, one of the contractor's risks was the compressed air, and they sized the plant wrong. So they had some issues. But they set a limit on liability. The contractor could only lose a million dollars on this job. No matter how much the job cost, he only could lose it. He could make money, but he couldn't lose more than a million dollars. So they had two separate contracts, hard bid on the Hudson River tunnels and negotiated bid on the East River tunnels. Now the people. This is the fun part, I think. This guy, he's my hero. I didn't know, even know he existed until two years ago. But this guy was so far ahead of his time, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I want to bring, I mean, the only purpose of this talk is that you get to remember this guy's name for a period of time. Samuel Ray. Now, he started with the Pennsylvania Railroad when he was 17 years old, uh, working a gun, right? He wasn't a university graduate, but everybody started at the Pennsylvania Railroad working a gun. They put him out in the field, they started working. Again, I won't go through his career. He eventually became the president of the Long Island Railroad, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad. By the way, they had purchased the Long Island Railroad, so the Pennsylvania Railroad, he became president, also owned the Long Island Railroad. He was the ninth president. You notice he was in office for 12 years. He didn't die of a heart attack. He actually was one of the first presidents to actually retire. He died of a heart attack two years later. <laughs> but he survived for 12 years. <laughs> This is something they had at the time, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of like a board of consult, like a dispute review board, except they had a board of engineers that designed these tunnels. It was kind of design build in a sense. The, the contractors implemented the designs. They hired, and again, this is a private company, so they hired the best people at the time to do this work, people that had experience with tunnels, mega projects, uh, uh, electric traction, etc. And they hired these people and they formed this board. This board made all the decisions. Well, they made recommendations. Samuel Ray, right in the middle there, he made the final decision, which is really key to this whole risk analysis thing. You can't have a board make decisions. One guy has to make a decision. He, made the, he was the owner. 
He was responsible. He was going to run the facility after the, uh, it was done. He made the final call on everything. They recommended. He took most of their recommendations, but on one critical aspect, he didn't, and that's what we're going to talk about. These are the people. Every, you know, mustaches were big at that time, so a lot of people with mustaches. Uh, these are all, again, uh, Jacobs, he built the first tunnel, Subacquius Tunnel in New York. He built the East River Gas Tunnel underneath the East River. He was involved in Hudson Manhattan Tubes. He was involved in the Pennsylvania Railroad, a key person at that, that period in, in New York in terms of tunneling. The other person of interest is Raymond right here. He was the chairman. Uh, again, a Corps of Engineer. He was started out as Colonel Raymond. Later on, he was General Raymond. But he became really Ray's only supporter on the board when tough decisions had to be made. All the other engineers, very noted people, wanted Ray to go a certain way, and he decided not to go that way. And we'll talk about that as quick as I can. Now, this is a little bit about Jacobs. Again, he became uh, from England. Uh, trained, uh, Austin Corbin met him in England, brought him over, and that's how he got involved in, in, in the work here. He was the chief engineer for the Hudson River crossing. Uh, the contractors, you always got to talk about the contractors. I mean, designers like to design and owners like to build, but the contractors actually build things, right? So we have two contractors here, right? You have O'Rourke, O'Rourke Engineering, that's, what's this, John Francis O'Rourke, Cooper Union graduate, son of Irish immigrants. Cooper Union graduate, again, became wealthy designing pneumatic caissons. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange foundations, he, he built those foundations. So we knew about compressed air. He got the contract to build a, the work under the Hudson. Ernst Moore was, was from the Pearson Company. He becomes a, an important figure mainly because of how he handled, he, inv he invented the medical lock when working on the uh, Hudson and Manhattan tubes uh, about 20 years earlier. So he becomes a key figure in getting the Sandhogs to continue with the work in the East River when they wanted to abandon the work because so many people had died. And this, is, by the way, is a picture of them driving through the, uh, the completed Hudson River tunnels. Uh, it wasn't, this is before the Holland Tunnel, so this was not meant to be a, a car tunnel. But it turned out that this fellow in the front here is a partner of O'Rourke and he had a car manufacturing company. So this is a good publicity shot for his car. So they drove through the tunnel. Another thing that's interesting here, that's Samuel Ray right here. There's Jacobs. James Forgey was an assistant to Jacobs. He's an important figure because all his archives, all his materials that he had as an engineer on this job and, and subsequent jobs are all at the Smithsonian. So if you want to read and see documentation and drawings and, and, and minutes of meetings, typed minutes of meetings, you know, you go to the Smithsonian, you see everything about the job, all the issues, all the costs, all the estimating, it's all there. Uh, Ernst Moore, again, I won't, it's a busy slide. Uh, he was the person who basically invented the medical lock when he was working on the Hudson Manhattan tubes. Not on the, he wasn't working on the tubes when they were finally completed. He was working on them when they were also stopped. They never completed the work. This was in the 1880s. He invented the medical lock, and it was an important feature on getting these tunnels done. Whoops, pressed the wrong button. So this is kind of the statistics. The old you know, Hudson and Manhattan tubes, the H&M tunnels, uh, Hudson and Manhattan tunnels, 25% of the sand hogs on the job died. When I came into the business, which is maybe with some of you, maybe I'm before most of you, but when I came into the business, it was basically considered one sand hog a mile. That's the way people thought. I mean, we don't think about that anymore, but that's the way people thought. But back then, it was much, much higher. When he got involved on the Hudson and Manhattan tubes, he brought it down to like a 0.5% uh, rate from 25% because of the medical lock and understanding a better appreciation of how compressed they worked on the body. I looked at some literature on the third tube of the Lincoln Tunnel and that was the rate on the, and that's not the death rate, that's the incident rate. Okay, very few people, I think one person died on that tube. So that's how, how much compressed air improved in terms of the safety of the crews and what made it, I mean, the, the system uh, in New York until relatively recently when you start getting uh, tunnel boring machines. The controversy. Okay. Uh, this, is the, this is the risk and mitigation part. I think that's useful for us today and it's kind of lessons learned so it's something we can take into the future even though it's historical. But they did some cool things back then. First of all, as an ex-contractor I know that schedule is everything, right? Jobs that finish early make money, jobs that finish late very often lose money. 
So schedule's very important. So what they did on this job, they knew they wanted to get the tubes done. They had an early on contract for the Weehawken shaft. They let out a separate contract to build the shaft in Weehawken before they let out the tunnel contract. They wanted the shaft done and ready to go when they let out the tunnel contract. And they were very lucky because the shaft was located, there was a contact zone between sandstones and, and the diabase, all fractured rock. The shaft was delayed six months, but it didn't, it didn't delay the tunnel work because it was an early on contract. Then they had separate contracts, which I mentioned earlier. They had a negotiated contract for the, for the East River Tunnel because they knew that was going to be very difficult to do, and they wanted someone with experience pre-qualified. They actually selected the contractor on that. And on, but they bid, the Hudson River Tunnels was a hard bid because they knew that they felt confident that someone with air experience could do that job. Again, they used multiple shields. That's a little bit, you know, they weren't able to operate all the shields all the time. They didn't have, especially in the East River, they just didn't have enough air. But if things weren't according to plan, they were going to run four shields on the Hutch River, which they did most of the time, and up to eight shields on the East River. So, you know, shields was something they just fabricated to get the job done early. And then they had to deal with mixed face and rock tunneling, which is kind of relatively new. Uh, again, it wasn't something they ran into in London. It was relatively new, uh, in compressed air, blasting inside compressed air, D difficult work. They got involved with steel sets. There's some issues there. They had steel sets, not just cast iron sets. They had blows, major issues with blows and how they handled the blows, especially in the East River. Again, it was clay blankets and controlling the air and things like that. They learned as they, as they went along. The last part that we're going to talk about a little bit about the controversy was settlement and buoyancy. It's kind of learn as you go. Uh, Jacobs was involved in Hudson Manhattan Tube. In Hudson Manhattan Tubes, they could shove the shield blind. You shove the shield blind on, on the Hudson Manhattan Tubes, the, the muck, the soil is displaced, and you shove the shield blind. But that was an 18-foot diameter shield. The Pennsylvania Railroad Tunnels had 23-foot diameters. When they shoved the shield blind, the shield went everywhere. It went up, it went down, it went this way, that way. It went everywhere. They couldn't control the shield. So over time, they realized they had to let 50% of the muck through. So they opened up the doors, let 50% of the muck come through, and they were able to steer the shield. So they learned as they went. But there was also issues with settlement. They were in relatively soft ground. Now, this is not the East River, by the way. Again, the settlement issues we're talking about, again, is, 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 is not. The harder tunneling was the East River because of the sands and the rock and everything else. The settlement issues, but those materials were relatively good in terms of stability of the tunnel. In the Hudson River, you had the settlement issue. So the settlement issues all talk about the Hudson River. And my feeling is that this, the observational method that we all, as geotechnical engineers, we all talk about, and we think it kind of started with, with Tazagi and it was written up by Peck, actually started back here in 1903, way before that Tazagi did his work and way before that paper was written. And it, was, and it was developed by Samuel Ray. Anyway, this is the uh, issues. They had issues with, you know, they tried to mine two shields simultaneously, and, you know, one shield would push the tunnel. You know, that they, they learned as they went. So there were issues with lateral movements. Uh, they learned about, again, opening the face of the shield, maybe keeping the shield further back, not running the shield simultaneously. They learned as they went. There were movements up and down. They didn't, they didn't know what, what caused it. Eventually, they figured out by, again, looking at data. They kept looking at data. Why was the tunnel moving up and down? It was the tide. When the, water, when the high water pushed the tunnel down, low water, the, tide, the tunnel went up. Small amounts, they were worried that this would go on and this would damage the tunnels. It never did. The other issue was settlement. They were concerned about settlement of the tunnels. So the issue we came in, and this is the key point of the talk, shall we put piles in? Do we need to support the tunnel on piles? Now, there had been a precedent for piles. The Jerome Street Tunnel is supported partially on piles. Now, I had the, when I was at PB many years ago, we had a contract to inspect the tunnels. And I inspected this tunnel. And the fact that they used piles, you could see what happened. And basically, you had issues. They had, by the way, they had rebar also. Uh, they had rebar in the tunnel. So you had spalling. The rebar would rust. The concrete would spall. You had piles. You had hard spots. Another problem for the tunnel, the tunnel couldn't settle uniformly. Again, led to a lot of maintenance issues. So there was precedent for it. So the people on the engineering board, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the, the, the board of consultants, were looking towards piles. Now, by the way, to talk about risk mitigation, before the job even started, they knew there would be an issue with settlement. They thought there would be an issue with settlement. So someone, so Jacobs came up with this idea of building a bridge inside the tunnel. 
Now, when I looked at this, I said, you got to be kidding. This, this guy's nuts, right? But in reality, it made sense, not, not because he was going to do it. The Pennsylvania Railroad needed a solution. Worst case scenario, right, risk-wise, the worst case scenario happens. How can we build this tunnel? So his idea was to build, uh, basically you're using the, the skin as a protection. You build a, a trestle inside the tunnel, support it on a shaft so piles down to rock. The important thing about this, it got the, the Pennsylvania Railroad to commit to building the tunnel because they knew they had a way out. Worst case scenario, they had a way out. They didn't embarrass themselves and their stockholders. They were able to find that we have a way out. So it's always good to have a way out. Anyway, these are the options. That's the typical lining on one side. Uh, again, cast iron, uh, a, a concrete inner lining, secondary lining. And that's the, the pile supported lining. Now this is the segment. You see the segment? There's that hole in the bottom. So if they had to install the piles, they could support the, uh, install the piles through that, that cast iron segment. There was provision for it. Now, let me go back to this picture here. This is it. The good thing about this is that the engineers, as well as, as, well as Samuel Ray, didn't just leave it at that. They actually tried to install piles during the, they tried using screw piles, they tried to install piles, they tried to install, they wanted to see how it would work, how would you get a pile in. So in selected areas, they put some test piles in. They tried to put piles in, tried to screw, they, again, they tried a pipe pile, they couldn't get it to go in straight. The best solution seemed to be a screw type pile, but they did some tests during, during the work. So that led to this. Then you have this debate, should we use piles or not, okay? The Board of Engineers had recommended when, it's the first, when it first started, 2002, we want to use piles. That's the way to go. Piles is the way to go, okay? The tunnels were being mined, except for Raymond, the chairman, and Ray, everybody wanted to use piles. They were concerned about movements, we've we got to have piles. We, Ray kept saying, let's wait for the data. To, no, he's a surveyor, an ex-surveyor, and they did a lot of surveying in these tunnels. Let's wait for the data to come in. Let's see what's happening. Let's, I don't want to do it yet. Let's wait. Manana, you know, let's wait. And he's the owner, he could do that, right? He's the owner. So they kept waiting. They tried the screw piles. Uh, they took cores to find out where rock was. They did some testing. Then they, in, two, in 1907, they recommend piles again. Again, Raymond and Ray said no. I mean, mainly it was Ray, but supported by Raymond. I still want to see more data. I, I want to see. I want to, what happens when we, this, what happens when we put the concrete lining in? What happens when the trains start running in it? Okay? All the stuff. He kept asking for more data. He would not make a decision without data. He wouldn't make a decision. Uh, some of the engineers, unfortunately, as a consulting engineer now, sometimes they were concerned about losing face with the public. What happens if it starts settling? What, how do we, you know, how will we save our reputations, etc.? But he was the owner. So he, and he, don't forget, he was in line to become the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, so he stuck his neck out. If, he, if anything happened in those tunnels, he wouldn't have been the ninth president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. That's, that's a damn sure, right? So anyway, finally, in 1908, he still refused. Okay? Gradually, he started winning people over. Then in, at the end of 1908, he said, no way we're going to put piles in. We'll have piles available. Once the trains start operating, we'll have piles available. If we need to put them in, we can put them in. But we're not putting them in now. And that was a pretty courageous decision. Now, this is, this is his reasoning. When you think about it, it's kind of modern way of thinking. Is the cure worse than the disease? One thing they found when they installed piles, the ground settled around the tunnel because they were disturbing the ground around the tunnel. So installing the piles was a, a problem. Every time they installed piles, the tunnel settled more. Right? So that was an issue. Uh, they were very difficult to install, very difficult to get plumb inside the tunnel. There was issues about a rigid connection, to mention what I mentioned about Girolamo Street. Now you have a rigid connection, it's going to cause issues with cracking, you won't get uniform settlement. Uh, the people talked about a slip joint, but there was concern about water coming into the tunnel. So there was a lot of issues, so, so maybe the cure wasn't, you know, let's, the disease may not be as bad as the cure, right? What does the data tell us? They found out the tunnels were oscillating, a very small amount due to the tides, they could live with that, okay? Uh, they found that tunnels were settling during the installation, but suddenly gradually dropped off. They put test trains in there. They got very little movement, and the movement was elastic. When the trains left, the tunnel went back up. 
So more and more data was coming in. So this idea that Ray had, let's wait for the data. Don't make a decision prematurely. Let's get the data. Very important. And it was case histories. The H&M tunnel was being built at the time. That tunnel wasn't going down. The St. Clair tunnel had already been built, and that was a heavy rail tunnel, and that wasn't settling. So they were getting case history data indicating this really wasn't a problem. And is there a way out? Yeah, I'm the owner. If there's a problem, I'll single track the tunnels. I'll move all the trains to one tunnel, I'll put the piles in the other. I have a way out. Always have to have a way out. And he had a way. Even though he didn't believe it would happen, he had a way out. So when this is all said and done, it's 1912. So remember that Lindendahl was the bridge engineer who built the tunnel, the, the bridge. That didn't happen because of the uh, problem with the uh, competitors. He was also on the board. And then at that, by 1912, everybody on the board agreed that Ray had been right and they had been wrong. And these were the best engineers in the world at the time. Okay? And they agreed that his approach was the correct approach. But by the way, he wasn't, he became president, but the, uh, James Forgey, the person I mentioned earlier who worked was Jacob's assistant, he started his own company in, in America after the job was done, and he was hired by, by Ray to monitor the tunnel every three months for the whole remaining of Ray's presidency, just to make sure that things stayed the same, that the tunnel, the settlements were, were acceptable. So anyway, lessons learned. Am I okay in terms of, oh, okay, lessons learned. First of all, think big. I mean, it's nice to be the owner and be able to do this, and obviously with their own money, they didn't have to worry about federal funding. Can't always do that now, but it's a huge project. I mean, a huge project, two rail yards, tunnels under the East River, tunnels under the Hudson River, Pennsylvania Station. That's a fantastic uh, thinking big. Minimize the schedule risk. Make sure that you build things into the project where you minimize the schedule risk. Uh, early on contracts, it's all important. The observational method, what else can we say? As geotechnical engineers, we, we live by this, right? So, but that was, you can't make decisions based on, you know, you know, top of the head. You gotta have some data. Figure out ways to get data, whether it's case history data, data on your job, look at the data, give yourself a little time, don't make abrupt decisions that could lead to worse problems later on. Alternative contracts, remember? Hard bid in the Hudson, negotiated bid in the East River. Made a lot of sense and it worked on this job. Always think safety, more develop the safety lock. I mean, the sand hogs were very, very appreciative of that. And they, in one of my slides, they made a statement to him. They gave him an award because he saved so many lives. You always have to think about safety on these jobs. And don't forget the engineers. In other words, don't forget these people. I mean, I didn't even know the names of most of these people until I started doing a little research into this. But these are really people you can learn from. It's not people that are in the past and you just forget about them. They did things at that time that we can learn from today. The final thing is, Samuel Ray's statue is at the uh, Penn Station. Uh, if you go on the internet, you'll see people put the Ranger jer jersey over it and stuff like that when the Rangers are playing, but he's, it's, he's still there. Uh, and of course, the Sandhogs. I mean, we all talk about tunnels, but those are the guys who build it. Uh, the Sandhog Union, I mean, the Sandhogs started to organize in, when they were building the Brooklyn Bridge, but the actual local came into being at, uh, in 1905, partly because of the debts and everything that involved in the East River Tunnel. So those are the guys that build it, and those are the guys we've got to think about all the time when we design and, and propose these projects. So that's it. Thank you.